Hello, my name is Jakob, and uh, for years I've been chasing that elusive tone from Opeth's song Window Pain, and particularly the second solo, the cleaner one in the middle of the song. This so tone has always been sort of a white whale to me. I've bought and sold thousands of dollars of gear, and I've searched high and low for information, including rewatching the making of documentaries again and again, uh, looking for clues. And I might even have had a few disturbed nights from this, either laying sleepless pondering about how to get the tone or dreaming of a magic guitar that would, uh, would get me that tone one day. And then just a few days ago, I sort of figured out some uh, missing pieces to get that tone. Uh, and, and when that all fell together, I felt like I got really close. And uh, when I shared the video online on the uh, Opus subreddit, people seemed to agree with me that it was indeed very close. So um, now I'm excited to share all the details with you about how I got there. For your information, this is gonna be the first of two videos. The first video is this one where I'm gonna tell you what I did to figure out the tone. And of course, I'm gonna show you the gear that I used to get there with enough uh, information that you can copy my approach. But for those of you who just want like, the results, of having a tone that's uh, close or similar, there's gonna be a second video where we'll try to dial in the window pane lead tone using only amp sims and plugins, and then of course the knowledge that came from this video. So that video is gonna come out soon. All right, uh, please comment, like, and subscribe. And if this information has been useful for you for something, or you just uh, had a slightly better day from watching this video, I don't know. Uh, I'd love to hear back from you. Cool, so now that all that is sorted out, let's get started. All right, so uh, a funny thing. I found out when researching this video that I have been looking for the window pane tone for over 12 years. I found a mail from 2009 of me writing a guitar builder asking for a, a pickup for this guitar that would give me the Opeth tone. And of course it didn't work, but that's, that's where it all started a very, very long time ago. Okay, so I've been looking for this tone really, really long. And I think that already back then, I had started to make an assumption that I would hold on for a very, very long time. The assumption was that if I took the right guitar with the right pickup, and I put it into the right amp, then that exact lead tone from window pane that I was hearing on the record and inside of my head would just like jump out uh, at me from the speakers. So just those three parts, guitar, pickup, amplifier. And of course, with me being a guitarist, the guitar itself had to be the most important part of the equation, right? So after the yellow guitar, I had a few other guitars uh, until I finally wisened up and bought my first PRS guitar back in 2015, a custom 24 from a more affordable uh, S2 line. Still made in America, but a little cheaper. And it sounded like this. Honestly, that tone is not bad in its own right. It sort of gets the window pane vibe and the Fender Mustang amplifier that I used back then definitely like punched pretty well over its class for its price. Um, but it was never really as close as I'd have wanted it to be. And I was never satisfied with the sound of that guitar, even though it played amazingly well. And so the search continued for this unique and delicate window pane tone. I'd get hold of a new guitar or set of pickups, play it through an amp on uh, clean settings, trying to approximate the sound and always just come away from it feeling a little bit ho hollow and like I was missing something. 
So I experimented with various guitars, pickups, amp modelers, impulse responses, and EQ settings, always seeing if I could get a little closer. I typically hold on to the guitars that had some of that lovely neck pickup characters and then sort of sell the rest. And I ended up owning a bunch of PRSs of various price levels over the year, but most of them went on to new homes because they didn't really do that thing and that uh, that I was wanting them to do and uh, they just had to move on. <laughs> Uh, but in the process, I did make some worthwhile discoveries, though, such that if I had a clean amplifier model with maybe like a Vintage 30 impulse response, and I boosted it around 2 kHz on the EQ, um, then that would get me somewhat in the ballpark of the sound. Even though I didn't really succeed in nailing the tone, I still held on to that core assumption that I could get the sound with just the right guitar, pickups and amplifier, and eventually I'd exhausted all other ideas than to try and get the exact same gear that they used on the record. Which is a little crazy, but I, th I think, you know, yeah, I, I guess I'm just a little obsessed with the tone. That's, that's how it goes. Um, but that meant that I got a PRS Custom 24 from the early 2000s, minus 2006. Theirs is probably at 2000, 2001, so it's a little bit of a difference, but it's okay. And then I also got the Seymour Duncan Full Shred pickups and the Laney VH100 amp, which was the last uh, part of the chain that I got. And um, they did list other amplifiers in their equipment list for the albums, but the Laney is the only amp that I thought would produce a decent clean sound. Uh, looking at the other amps, they listed like rectifiers and 5150s. Um, so I thought, ah, Laney, that's, that's probably what they use for cleans. Uh, and then they also listed other guitar brands such as Gibson and Fender, but I was a little bit too deeply invested in PRS at the time to like uh, really even acknowledge that. Um, so now that I had all that gear, it had to do the trick, right? Like, you know, it would totally nail it right. The window pane would tone would just jump out of, at me. That's what I was saying. It had to jump out of me. I had all the gear, right? And to my great disappointment, it didn't really. And I think if you watched my video from back then uh, that I made when I got the amp, you can see the disappointment in my face when I, uh, when I try playing a little bit of the window pane intro. Just watch this. Okay, so something had to change. Uh, but by that time, I had of course discovered the surround mix of Damnation, which is a great help because you can actually listen to the lead guitar completely isolated in the, uh, the center track of, uh, of the mix. And uh, even though the mix is in, in stereo is not exactly the same as it is in surround and vice versa, um, this was still a key to moving forward. Have a listen to this. First, I didn't really use it for that much. Uh, I did some like rudimentary uh, EQ matching, some automated EQ matching on my tones, and I found out that yes, indeed, there was a lot of uh, two kilohertz, maybe three kilohertz information in the tone, such as I had found when I was dialing it in manually uh, when trying to get the tone before. And it was also kind of great for uh, nailing those notes that I was uh, unsure of and to fix my most offensive phrasing issues. But other than that, I couldn't really use it to get any further because there was one key component that I hadn't embraced. Now, if you've done any kind of audio engineering, you will realize immediately when you hear that sound that was just playing how ridiculously compressed that guitar is. But for me, the first time that I heard the isolated track was a few years ago. And with my level of audio engineering knowledge at that time, this was not something that I was accustomed in taking into account. Um, I mean, of course I could hear that there was compression on it, 
But when I was sitting around in my amp sims and turning on their compressor, it didn't really do that much. Uh, whenever I'd experimented with compressor pedals in the past, it also just wasn't a situation that I ever stepped on a compressor pedal and thought to myself, wow, that's the window pane lead tone. Um, so that was not a success either. Also, I felt that using that much compression on guitar was just plain wrong. Nobody in real life would use that much compression, right? I mean, compressors are only for people who play funk and country. At least that's what I thought. And so I pushed any observation about compression aside and I gave up and I moved on to other things in life. So I have since come to learn a lot more about audio engineering. It's been something that I've had to do because I've been working on my own music, finally starting to work on the album that I've always dreamt of making myself. And uh, with that, I've also gotten to know compressors a little bit better. I don't really think that I understood the impact they can have on audio before very recently. And I still don't understand that much, but I think that I've finally realized that what you get from a compressor also depends heavily on the kind of compressor that you're using and where in your stage it is, um, like your signal chain it is, and also how you dial it in, of course. So finally, after learning all that, I was ready to challenge my purest assumption that the window pay lead tone was just the right guitar with the right pickup into the right amplifier. And that compression was actually part of the signal chain and the equation here. So I fired up my uh, Laney amplifier. Here it's uh, standing on the floor. And I dialed it to the clean channel. I, I plugged in my uh, Custom 24 with the full thread pickup in the neck. And I, uh, and that just sounds like this. And then I uh, did some EQ matching where I uh, matched the, the EQ of my guitar to the, the EQ, of, EQ of the recording. And then it sounds like this. And then I started playing with compression and I um, put a compressor. This one is called uh, Kotelnikov that you can get a free version of from Tokyo Dawn Records. But it really doesn't matter what compressor you're using. It's more about dialing it in, using your ear to get the best possible tone. And uh, here is what it sounds like with the compressor off. <laughs> And here is what it sounds like with the compressor on. So already we can hear here that the compressor, the way I've set it, I've set it with, um, with a quite forgiving ratio and even a little bit of dry blend in. It's just a three to one ratio uh, and what it does is that it kind of takes the note and it smoothens it out. So here is, uh, here is uh, without the compressor. And here is with the compressor. Already there's something that uh, started to happen there that I really like. It might but not be so obvious to the to the, the untrained ear, but you know, just kind of like smoothens it out. Here here again is a little bit more. Um, here is the compressor on. And here is the compressor off. So yeah, that's um it's 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 something that just kind of started to give me the sense that, okay, I was on the right track with compression here. And then there were two things that uh, jumped to mind. Let's just listen to the uh, solo recording again. 
Okay, you can hear that there is a little bit more overtones there. There's a little bit more harmonics, there's a little bit more like juiciness in the sound. And um, there's also this squash when you uh, when he starts to hit every note. There's this like clicky squash kind of sound. And um, and I started thinking to myself, okay, well, I've always assumed that this was a clean sound because in my head, like, you know, that's that's a clean solo. But then hear what happens when I turn my amplifier over to the distortion channel. This is uh, before, after. Wow, that is a lot closer. I mean, yeah, I tried playing this uh, solo with distortion before, but it just never sounded right. And it's this is this is happening. My my signal chain is that the guitar amplifier is captured, and then it goes into my uh, door, and then I am compressing and and then. I am equalizing it. And this EQ has been set to sort of match uh, the sound from the track before. And, and all of a sudden I realized, huh, maybe this solo, this clean solo is actually way more distorted than I thought. But if you look at the EQ and what they do is that after that three kilohertz peak, um, there is just like a steady roll off of the treble all the way down. And I think this is the key. I think it's that solo is way more distorted, but because they don't have that much high end information, uh, which is usually what happens when you distort a guitar, like is that you hear a lot more high end harmonics because you get all those multipliers of harmonics. You're not hearing that because they're rolling it off. So, Actually, this is it. There's compression and there is more distortion than you think because the high end is slightly rolled off and the peak is sort of in the middle around those two kilohertz frequencies. So that was it. But I was still missing that last bit of squash. So I grabbed the only uh, compressor pedal which I have, the Exotic SP compressor, and then I just dialed in a little bit. It has a blend, so I, I put it in on medium setting and I just blended it in a little bit. And here's what happened when I did that. Before, and now after hitting the compressor. And without. it that's the sound like is it is it exactly that is it exactly that sound no but when i put it into the mix and and that's the, the the great thing about the surround mix is that you can remove the center channel and then you just don't have any solo there's a little bit of delay in uh, in the channels but i could overpower that with my own sound and when i started playing inside of that i was like yes this is so much better. It feels so much more right. And it was a lot of fun to play and it was just a fantastic moment for me to realize, oh, okay, compression and a little bit more distortion than I had always thought, that I had ever assumed. Like compression, desaturation, and some high-end roll-off and some focus on the two kilohertz. That's the key to the window pane sound. Um, 
and yeah it just it feels good it feels right and it's it's at a point where of course you can listen to this in solo and i'm i'm gonna put a back-to-back -back sample uh, right now mine and now we hear the uh, other one this exactly the same no there are differences but in the context of the song this sounded really good it was actually a, so good that when i was uh, editing the video that i was doing i got a little bit confused about uh, whether i had highlighted the original track or my own track at one point and that's like uh, it's not to be a uh, pineapple in my own juice, as we say in Denmark. <laughs> it's not to, it's not to uh, to boast, or maybe it is to boast. Yes, it is to boast that uh, that um, that that sound got close, and um, yeah, that's it. I'm happy. Awesome. So I feel that's the end of my journey to get that tone. To summarize what I've learned, I think it shows how much you can change a guitar tone with compression and the perception of the guitar tone also with the compression and how surprisingly heavily compressed some sounds are in studio recordings. Much more than you would find in like 95% of all guitarists' live sounds. But sometimes that's what you need to fit into an arrangement. I also discovered how much you can hide distortion and saturation just by gently rolling off the high end of a signal so that you can still obtain those juicy harmonics in the mid-range without making it obvious how high gain that it actually is. And after getting this tone, there are two things that are important for me to contemplate. The first thing is, did it actually matter that I used any of the gear that I did and am um, I sure that Opeth and Steven Wilson used the same gear? And the answer to that is a big fat resounding no. I know for a fact that I am I don't have exactly the tone and even if I use some of the gear that they did use um, it's definitely not exactly the same gear because I don't have access to that. Um, I cannot say for sure that they used uh, Paul Reed Smith or that it was with uh, full strat pickups or that they used uh, a Laney amplifier or that they even used a guitar amplifier for this. You know, it could have very well have been just a guitar plugged into a studio compressor and then directly into an overdriven studio console and then a studio EQ. It could also have been uh, that they had a Boss GT3 uh, floorboard in the studio, um, a, a pedal that uh, Michael favored for using uh, live in those years. It could also have been done inside of a computer. It's very well documented that even in like the early 2000s, Stephen Wilson was actively pushing the boundaries of audio with digital technology at the time. He'd do literally anything to audio, whether we're talking about heavy analog or digital coloration. And the window pane tone isn't even that far out for him, uh, like when you think about it. Um, in fact, there's nothing groundbreaking about using a couple of compressors and a bit of EQ on your guitar. But uh, maybe if he hadn't had such a will to push things a bit, we wouldn't have had like, you know, just this exact level of sonic beauty, which, uh, which I think is always going to be one of my favorite sounds. Then there was uh, one other question, uh, the, the second question that I had, which is, can we use this general approach that we have found today to get a window pane style a clean lead tone, but with completely unrelated gear from uh, what I used this time around. That means no PRS Custom 24, no uh, CMOD Duncan Full Thread pickup, and uh, no Laney amplifier. But we're going to leave that question for the next video, where I'm going to try to do exactly that. So that's it. Um, if you made it this far in this video, thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to hear from you in the comments and I'd be happy for a like and a subscribe. So uh, see you next time and all the best. Checking out. Bye.